is this all the beginning of a dystopian hellscape or is this the dawn of a new era of creativity and productivity? George the Tech. Hey, everybody. George the Tech. Oh, man, do I have a treat for you guys today. <laughs> I have a very special guest. Now, I work with voice actors day in, day out, and I love working with them. This is a different whole world. This is a person that comes from journalism and media and music. And I'm so proud that he's chosen us to work with him and develop his home studio. And to, to share his story with us today, I've got David Pogue. How are you doing, David? Well, I'm doing well. Thank you. Do you mind if I indulge the audience with a real quick, very fastly read bio right from your website? Dive in. Better than you having to do it. David, <laughs> David Pogue was the New York Times weekly tech columnist from 2000 to 2013. He's a six-time Emmy winner for his stories on CBS Sunday Morning, a New York now Times. Now seven, actually, but who's Seven, because that's out of date. Hey, man, that's <laughs> awesome. A five-time TED speaker, host of 20 Nova Science Specials and, and PBS, there might be more, um, a creator and host of the CBS News slash Simon & Schuster podcast, Ung Sun Science. Unsung Science, say that five times fast. That is an awesome show, by the way. Listen to it. He's co-written or written more than 120 books, including dozens in the Missing Manual Tech series, which he created in 1999, six books for the Dummies line, including Max, Magic, Opera, and Classical Music, two novels, one for middle schoolers, his three best-selling Pogues basic books of tips and shortcuts, I got one on the shelf, on tech, money, and life, his how-to guides iPhone Unlocked and Mac Unlocked, and his 2021 magnum opus, How to Prepare for Climate Change. And after graduating summa cum laude from Yale in 1985 with distinction in music, Pogue spent 10 years conducting and arranging Broadway musicals in New York. He has won a Loeb Award for Journalism, two Webby Awards, and an honorary doctorate in music. He lives with his wife, Nikki, and their blended brood of five spectacular children in Connecticut and San Francisco. How you doing, Dave? <laughs> I need to trim that thing down, don't I? You know what the that's... best thing about bios is? Is when you hear them read out loud, you always think that's the first thing that always comes to mind is, man, I got to trim that thing down. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, that's half half your show right there. <laughs> yeah, so what's your, what is your day-to-day -day now that you're uh, the Unsung Heroes, uh, Unsung Science show is is sunsetted, right? Um, yeah. What are you doing yeah. with your life now that you don't have that show to produce? Well, I mean, my main gig is is uh, CBS Sunday Morning. I do about 30, 35 stories a year uh, for that show, which is on CBS on Sunday mornings. <laughs> um, and it is, uh, it's an incredible show, both for the audience and for us, because we get to suggest our own stories, pitch our own stories, I get to write my own stories. I conduct my own interviews. Um, I don't think that happens anywhere else. Like if you're at 60 Minutes or the Evening News or whatever, you know, they give you assignments and the, the producer writes the story. And oh, you know, so, I see. yeah, so for, for me as a creative dude and as a writer, it's just it's just pure heaven. And it's, you know, because because of the Internet, it's also almost a, a live performance art now because the minute the show airs, you know, people are online. There's a great Facebook group called Fans of Sunday Morning uh, where people discuss every story and um, and you can interact. It's 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 the greatest gig. So that's my main gig. Um, I have a two book deal with Simon & Schuster. The first one was the how to prepare for climate change. And now I'm working on the next one, which uh, let me tell you, the wheels of commercial publishing turn very slowly. So <laughs> they they say once I turn in the manuscript, it should be on the shelves in a year. So Tough we're talking to be topical in that world. Uh, Christmas 2025 yeah. is what we're looking forward to. <laughs> yeah, and things do move pretty slowly in that world. But it's, it's in a world I haven't entered into myself yet. And I may this year. Um, but um, tell me a little bit about the background. So, you know, you, you've had music as a basis of your education and, and your life for how, how long did the, did that stint or the career, I should say, really in music go before journalism and media start to take over your life? I was doing the Broadway thing professionally for, for 10 years, like right out of college. Um, I, it's not gone completely by any means. I'm always oh, good. writing new stuff. I just, 
I just just got this baby for input. This is the coolest ninety dollar oh, yeah. gadget. <laughs> It's a uh, it's a wireless MIDI controller, so I can. Uh, it doesn't need cables to the Mac to enter music. Yeah, um, and uh, it's it's got built in speakers, so in a pinch I can use it to play or sing for someone in the living room, whatever. It looks like it's um, carry on size, like it'll fit it in is. a carry on. It comes with bag. a case. Uh, it it comes with a pedal. So this is interesting. So I found out about this on Facebook. I um, I don't know how far to go back in the story, but all right, so I'll just tell you. So last year I did a story about a singing group in the Windsor Castle in London. It's six people called the Queen's Six. And it came about because the Queen, who has now died, uh, used to say after an evening concert of, you know, uh, classical pieces, she would say, haven't you got something lighter? You know, like a, a, mm -hmm. a show tune or, or a jazz standard. So, this group of six split off from the main Queen's choir. And we did a story about them. And after they, and then shortly after the story aired, they had their world premiere in New York City. I went to their concerts. They were great. We took them out to, my wife and I took them out to dinner afterwards. It's only six people. And, um, and during this meal, they mentioned, you know, there's a guest apartment at Windsor Castle. And okay. I'm like, wow, yeah. Oh my God. And they're like, well, if you're ever in London, I'm like, okay, wait a minute. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Is it on Airbnb? Can you, can you just go no. on there? <laughs> no, you got to be a very special guest. And I said, I will write you a custom arrangement of any song you want if you will let my family and me stay there. And they're like, done. So <laughs> That's awesome. last summer we went and we stayed in Windsor Castle for four days. It was insane. Like, you walk by these paramilitary guys with rifles and, you know, yeah. stop, who are you? You know, yeah. um, and so then, you know, I had to pay the piper. I had to write them uh, an arrangement. So it's been a long time since I did any uh, arranging on the, mm -hmm. on the Mac here. So I went to Facebook and I said, I need a small, lightweight uh, MIDI controller. That is a, a, a keyboard that enters music into the computer. Yep. Most of them, if they're small and light, they don't make sounds. They're just controllers and you're supposed right. to use GarageBand or whatever for the sounds. Or they have built-in speakers and they're giant. They're pianos. And right. like 550 responses to this quest. Um, later on, you're going to ask me how I found you. And, of course, uh, of course. Guess what? That's how I asked my <laughs> Facebook fans. It's yes. the greatest. It's the Oracle. It's the greatest. Yes. So I just did a, an arrangement of Video Killed the Radio Star for the Queen Six, who will be performing it in their 2024 concerts. And now, That's you know. Awesome. So so you got to stay in the castle before you delivered the product? I did. I they paid you in advance? Yeah. I'm yeah. impressed. I'm yeah, impressed. No, that's amazing. Very cool. So I love that. I love to find out that music is still a big part of your life. That's really awesome. I do have a music degree myself, and I haven't made music a regular part of my life for quite a while. And I still have my trumpet on the shelf up there for the day it will re-inspire me. My daughter's 15 and learning guitar and has learned a lot of other instruments on a basic level. So the music is always there and um, it's so important. It really informs how I listen to sound, right? Yeah. And that's, yeah. I think, um, and I have all these questions written down and I'm not probably going to follow the script at all because this is it's more fun to have a conversation what was so cool about working with you other than the fact that you love science and technology and you write about it um is that you are enthusiastic about what we're doing um for many of my clients they may be enthusiastic but they're bewildered they're overwhelmed <laughs> they don't want to really understand what's going on they want they, they really kind of want to click this button fix and i do oh, a lot I of see. click this button fixes for people and i do a lot of you were so much more engaged in the process of how do we solve the issues we need to solve for you. And that for me was really awesome. So just to kind of get into it, um, what is it we needed to solve? So why did we work together? Yeah, so so this is kind of a cool story. Um, I have done CBS Sunday Morning for, for 22 years. 20, yeah, 22 years. And I had a sound booth in the basement of of my house in Connecticut. It was meant to be a wine cellar, just a little like six foot by six foot 
concrete box mm -hmm. and I glued acoustical foam all over it. I put rugs, I hung stuff on the walls and I got it to the point where the echo wasn't too bad. And I could do all my own narration from home, like years before any other correspondents were doing that. Most people go to the CBS building on 57th Street in New York. But right. this way I could just retake a line or rewrite something on the, on the spot. And I was saying earlier that I interview voice actors. My clients are voice actors. You're not a voice actor, but you do narration. You do voice over work from home. Yeah, I, I narrate every every story. And then yeah. uh, and then this podcast started a couple of years ago, Unsung Science. And, uh, and then I moved because I became an empty nester and moved to a, a smaller but nicer house in um, – in Westchester County of New York. And this it came with this office already to go, um, but super echoey. Sure. And I was not about to like start gluing acoustical foam and nailing blankets to the wall. Um, my wife and I both thought that was a poor idea. So I couldn't understand why most of the news people you hear on TV do not have an ambient echo in in their home studios i mean i know you like go into your go into your clothes closet with the microphone i know i know i know but i i do it so often that i really wanted something permanent and better so again i went to facebook oh at the time you may remember the plan was to buy one of those i sound isolation booths so mm -hmm. my question was what sound isolation booth should i get and that's i think what what triggered the the 500 I think I think that one had 700 responses. Um, apparently, everyone's got <laughs> an opinion about this. It's oh, a yeah. black art sound. I mean, audio. It is a black art, and everything from you know, there's a big contingent of people who said go into the clothes closet. There's a huge contingent of people who said just do it yourself. Get some plywood. Um, there were people who had bought this isolation booths. And the, each one, of course, loved the, the one they bought. And you should get this one. Mm -hmm. um, I even got CBS to agree to pay for the isolation booth. Mm -hmm. But then I started seeing these comments uh, in these hundreds and hundreds of comments. Like, I mean, an isolation booth is fine if the idea is to cut out traffic noise outside your apartment. That is not my problem here in Westchester County. Um, the problem is is room echo. And they said, it's not going to help your room echo. In fact, it, it might be worse because you're in this little enclosed space with hard walls, you know, behind the fabric. So that really worried me. And and then there were dozens and dozens and dozens and dozens of people said, saying, you have, you're just going to have to bite the bullet and treat the room. You're going to have to put up acoustical panels and you're going to have to like put a carpet down and uh, maybe change your mic and da, da, da. So about five of these people by way of comment, just put your name. That's it. No. I'd never heard of you, but like five of these people said, just talk to George and he'll he'll get you straightened out. So I contacted you and I'll tell the folks at home, this is what we came up with. There are uh, these beautiful acoustic tiles that are on the ceiling. They're on the walls behind me. George did a CAD drawing that uh, a 3D movable uh, model of the room where I could see exactly where they should go. They're, you know, as you can see, they're behind the computer. They're everywhere. Uh, there's a rug on the floor. Did not finally kill the echo to absolutely zero. Right. So at that point, you you recommended a plug-in for me that removes the last 5%. And now the sound is so good that the, the editors at CBS News are like, what are you using, man? It I really sounds, what are you sounds using, great. Man? <laughs> yeah so that's when you so that's impress the editors and the producers with your sound <laughs> from home it's always a good feeling yeah. um yeah so it, yeah that was the key we wanted to i wanted your office to still feel like a nice workspace from home and not feel like a studio of course the panels are kind of a you know the tip off that we've put something into the room um but at the end of the day it was to make it a comfortable workspace that you like to be in and you can do your narrations and do everything you do and do your appearances all from one place and i think that we were able to achieve that do you did you find that you were using the magic plug-in sauce on some of the stuff that you were everything producing? i do everything i do when i did, can tell you was it was it clarity vx do you it is clarity or? vx that's right 
Clarity, v, um, yeah, Clarity. V, I actually VXD had would, already yeah. been using uh, an AI. Mm -hmm. uh, I was using Crumple Pop, which I thought was a miracle already. Yeah, but it did do something to the original signal. It it kind of metalized it just a little bit, yeah. even at low settings. Yeah. Um. So when you suggested this thing, I was like, okay, dude, I've tried that, but this this Clarity thing is really so much better. Um, the subtly, one problem with it, it mm -hmm. works only in GarageBand. And mm -hmm. not in Final Cut, where I do all my mm -hmm. editing. Even even if it's pure audio, I still use Final Cut because I'm I'm so used to it. And yeah. it's got plenty plenty of good audio tools, but for some reason, Clarity does not work in there. I think so, I came up with a very arcane workaround for that. That we maybe uh, at some time maybe we'll try to make that work. <laughs> that would be cool. I did. Uh, yeah, I did try that. I could not. I could Couldn't not get, get it to, that work. to work. Okay. No. Well, I mean, the bottom line is that the product that you produce is great. And that's something else I wanted to, to talk about a little bit is I feel like you do have a bit of a drive for perfection. Do you feel like you have a drive for, for perfection? Is there a perfectionism in there? No. I, okay. I mean, I, I want it to be as good as it can be. And I want it to be very me. But at the same time, I work very fast. I mean, yeah. as you as you have noted, I, I do a lot. There's a couple of producers I work with at the show who are themselves sort of run and gun. Let's get, I mean, it's television. It's not, it's not, you know, Scorsese. It's not going to be right. watched a hundred times. It's, it's a, it's a news story. I mean, I like to think they're really good stories and we do finesse the editing and the mm -hmm. language and the interviews. We do spend a lot of work and time, but, but perfect. I, yeah, I'm yeah. not sure it's justified for something that will be seen once. Yeah, no, I, I, but I do know that you do appreciate the quality that we're that you're achieving from your studios, and and I have found that in working with people that do have to do have to appear on camera, um, it's very difficult to get both things great. It's very difficult to get. I mean, because if you listen to shows that are television shows, and I do, I li I subscribe to. I don't know if you do this, Dabber. Do you subscribe to any podcasts that are podcasts of TV shows? Do you do uh, that at all? I have, I have heard some, yeah. I went through yeah. a, a really good West Wing for a while. Yeah. and oh, it, it, oh, oh, so a drama. A drama. Not like a talk show, I guess, in that case. Oh, I see what you mean. Yeah. 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 If you listen to talk shows or anything that's a video format to show and then podcast format, the podcast format is not great, you know? And it's not just because there's no video. It's because the audio is nowhere near what it should be. And so this thing we're doing here, which we're trying to achieve is great video and great audio at the same time. You mentioned um, the on-camera part of it. The, the other thing I do in this room, uh, since the pandemic, you know, during the pandemic, all our interviews were conducted over Zoom, of course. Since the pandemic, we still will uh, we'll do interviews from home. I, I interviewed a guy in Munich yesterday mm -hmm. um, from this spot. And like behind the screen here, I have a, a very nice SLR. I have a, a wired uh, lavalier mic that goes mm -hmm. here um, and a lens that blurs all that. So it sure. looks super professional. So we're seeing you right now through uh, more of a webcam. Yeah, this is the laptop. Camera. Right. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. But all that goes slightly blurred. But you see the gold of that bookcase mm -hmm. and you mm -hmm. see you can make out the telescope and the mm -hmm. rocket. And mm -hmm. so it, it's interesting about that because... Again, this was a blank slate, this house, and I could have done anything I wanted in here. And I spent a lot of time trying to see what is the ultimate Zoom background or the ultimate remote interview background. Is there a standard? And like no one's figured it out. I mean, look at you. You're very close to the background. You, there's stuff to read. There's stuff it's everywhere. Stuff, so you've gone with the <laughs> communicate what I do. I see there's electronics, there's books, right. there's your logo. My brand, um, right. But news people like tend to do bookcases. Yeah. I'm like, it's not, it's it's not, it's paper. It's not really that I, I will attractive. say that there is a truly like actual functional thing to having a big bookshelf directly behind the person, as long as there's a lot of books. Absorbing it, sound. It acts as a sound diffuser. So yeah. the sound will will hit that and scatter in a lot of directions and therefore therefore breaking up standing reflections and waves and things like that. So there is some, you know, it's a lot better than when the pandemic started. And I think it was Stephen Colbert was literally sitting in the corridor of his house at one <laughs> yeah, point. That's right. Like what a what a crap show the productions were at the beginning of the 
I would love to just go back and watch some of those from the first month or two of the pandemic. Because boy, were they—they yeah. they were they were terrible. It 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 blew my mind how unprepared people I think really w were uh, to deal with it. And you know, and, and, as a technologist who works with people in their home studios, I'm of course sitting at home on the other side of the TV, screaming at the television. I'm right here. <laughs> Damn it. <laughs> I'm right here. I can help you. <laughs> it was frustrating. It was so frustrating, man. I'll tell you. Oh, I'm sure. But, uh, <laughs> but I mean, what is the pinnacle background? Like, um, a lot of YouTubers have now gone with like cool LED lighting, you know, under yes. shelf lights, and they yeah. painted a cool deep blue, and the light is low. That's cool. Right. But is that is that news? I, I don't know yeah, if that's like yeah. a news set. Um, yeah, so I'm yeah. I'm still trying to figure out what the set should be for these remote interviews. Some of my colleagues on Sunday morning, they shoot from inside their homes. They're like at a desk somewhere or there's, mm -hmm. I mean, I've seen open closet doors. I mean, it's like, I, I don't know if it wants to scream, I'm in my bedroom so much. I, I that was something we, we were supposed to leave behind in the beginning of the pandemic. Yeah, we, <laughs> how many right. viral videos were there? There was the wife or nanny with her pants down pulling the kids out of the frame that was a famous oh that british guy when his, his babies came toddling in oh my god that's so had, funny you could tell she was trying to pull her pants up at the same time <laughs> while she was <laughs> if you've ever wanted to know what it's like to google something and get zero results i've found it it is how to make the perfect remote news interview zoom background i mean there is not a single article or video on what that should be what the well, what you're even going for i'm going to introduce you to a, a to a resource and you will either uh run in horror because of the ridiculousness of the depth that these guys go into this stuff or you will embrace it and actually really find it an amazing resource but there's an incredible youtube channel called officehours.global um and it's run by oh. alex Lindsay. And they obsess about all of these topics. Really? To the degree that is way beyond even what we're doing. I've been trying to find this. They obsess about everything. I mean, they are the pinnacle of what you can produce using Zoom. You should see that. I mean, it looks like a television show. The quality is incredible. And it's an amazing product. And I've guessed on there numerous times. I've paneled there. And it's, you might, it might be right up your alley. So it just check changed my out. life. <laughs> <laughs> that one should check to check out oh my gosh i want to talk to you for two full freaking hours and it's just not i can't and you can't and it's just not respectful of, of your time oh i did i can't i can't leave you with i actually wrote a few very specific questions about everybody's favorite topic ai what are what are some tools in in, in ai or ai based tools that you use in your daily work do you use tools every day or just here and there as yeah. a I'd say I'd say so. I mean, as you know, I use that plugin every day. That's that's some that's an AI that's, based that's machine that learning clarity VX thing. Yeah, that is mm -hmm. it's miraculous. Uh, and then so, so sometimes I'll either edit my own stories for Sunday morning, or I will edit chunks of it. For example, I actually have uh, in a room over the garage. I have a green screen, an actual green screen with with nice lights and everything. Mm -hmm. And I do I do a lot of explanatory stories where uh, I just did one on, you know, the the debt ceiling shutdown thing. Mm -hmm. And to explain things, I have this fake, what looks like a fake, like giant whiteboard screen that I, I refer to and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> Meteorologist and, style, I guess. <clears throat> that's right. And yeah. so there's a lot of graphics on that screen and I, I make them myself. I use, you know, the OpenAI Dolly and now they've merged cool. Dolly into ChatGPT. So I, I use those, uh, is for, for illustrations, um, I use uh, ChatGPT often um, for ideas, you know, for idea generation. What are some good interview questions for a man who, whatever. I, exactly that today, and I'm mostly not using it, but it's just nice ah! to have a... <laughs> you use that nice... on me, you slacker? <laughs> I totally <laughs> did. But I wanted to have a framework because I wanted to make sure I'd done some preparation to make me feel... Like I wasn't just having a conversation, but at the end of the day, the having the conversation part's way more fun. What are I? What are maybe, what are some AI things that you refuse to use? Like you're, I'm just not going there, man. I'm not going to do that. Is there anything? I I don't think I'd refuse anything. I mean, I mean, I think the the bigger question is, you know, is this all 
the beginning of a dystopian hellscape or is this the dawn of a new era of creativity and productivity and obviously nobody knows the answer yet um yeah. there's you know I'm, I'm keeping my eye really tightly on on the deep fake phenomenon um yeah. i read you know, now now you can the point with deep fakes of course is that you can generate video and audio of anybody saying or doing anything even if they never did it so when you say you, you know, for, i mean literally you anybody you, watching this can anybody this. that's right and so, you know, for 10 years, it's been, well, this is the end of news. This is the end of trust. This is the end of politics. This is the end of democracy. Because, you know, you can make a video of a presidential candidate saying, you know, I like to have sex with sheep. And, you know, that guy's finished. But I read the wildest article in the New Yorker a couple months ago that I can't get out of my head. And I'd love to know what you and your listeners think about this. He said, don't worry about deepfakes because... After tens of thousands of these things have been put out there through several major elections, presidential elections even, there has never been one single case where a deep fake fooled anybody enough to change a vote, change an election. And it's true. There were deep fakes in 2016. There were deep fakes in 2020. But all they did was make news as, ooh, look what you can do with AI. None of the like like the, mm -hmm. the Nancy Pelosi slowed down video was mm. not actually an AI thing. Somebody just slowed it down. Yeah. But what I remember from that incident was not, ooh, Nancy Pelosi was drunk. No, what I remember for that incident incident was, ooh, somebody tried to make Nancy Pelosi drunk. So so in this article, the guy says, you know, there's all these Gal Gadot, you know, Wonder Woman um porn videos. Mm -hmm. where they use mm -hmm. AI to, to create deep fakes of Gal Gadot doing porn. Sure. But but when you see those, your thought isn't, oh my God, she's doing porn now? No. Your your immediate thought is, oh, somebody put her face on someone else's body and made a fake. Right. right. So I, I think that it's like, by definition, if something is shocking enough to change an election, like I like to tear kittens apart, says Trump or whoever, right. um, people would not, believe it if it's if it's mild enough to seem realistic then it won't change anybody's mind so yeah okay i don't know i like that perspective I, it feels a little i, bit I mean i'm not sure. i don't I know, know if it's accurate i don't know if i believe it i've a number of people i've mentioned this to including my wife think thinks that's that's dangerous thinking but it is true that there hasn't and and, and there is some stuff in other countries going on sri lanka yeah. there there are some some other situations where deep fakes seem to be uh, interfering with elections but it hasn't happened here. What did you think about New York Times' uh, lawsuit um, situation? Because I know yeah, it orders. triggered for me a reaction in that I need to have my own custom GP, chat GPT of my own knowledge base so I can start offering that to people before... I mean, it's not... Nobody can stop... I can't stop anybody from using my content that's out there in the public, but at least I have a place for people to go and get my information. Is that something that Bought that did how, how did that land with you when that announcement came out at the beginning of the year? On one hand, it doesn't seem fair that OpenAI is profiting from the combined output of every creative person on earth. On the other hand, it's every creative person on earth. So, like, what's my share? A tenth of a cent? Yeah. So, I'm, I'm not sure that's going to go anywhere. I mean, there's a bunch of those lawsuits. Is it of interest of you to have your own? chatbot um, that is of your own intellectual property and provide that to people as a service? You know, I was offered $1,500 plus royalties um, by a company who is making celebrity deepfake voices yeah. available. So anybody who wants to use my voice for an ad or a sure. business meeting would be able to do so. Yeah. Um, I, I turned it down just because... I, I don't have any control over what they're having me say. No, you don't. And I've I've lived long enough to know that internet lynch mobs are no fun. And I just didn't want to risk it. But I mean, I'm sure a lot of people are going for it and making a lot of money. How about if every book you've ever written is now consumable by any language on planet Earth? Is that compelling to you? It is. Yeah. Does the technology already exist? Is like, let's say, the Kindle formats of your books, are they already all translatable? Is that already a thing that I don't there, even know I about? mean, my, my books are available in, depending on the book, like 15, 
only languages. But weirdly, that technology is not really polished yet. Like we're right. still at Google Translate level of, yes. of making mistakes. So yeah. I don't know why that is. And I also don't, don't know why transcription by AI is not better than it is. I mean, there's a million companies who will take this conversation and turn it into a text document transcript. Yeah. Um, but they're just full of errors still. I don't, I don't know why that's oh, so yeah. hard. No, when I'm done this, I'm going to be saving this video and porting it into Descript, letting it transcribe the whole thing, creating an interview format. I may I may set a multicam edit where it switches cameras or I might do a split screen. I'm not sure yet. If I'm going to show captions on screen, I will darn sure make sure that the captioning is accurate. If it's not on screen and no one's going to see it, I probably won't give it much thought. But um, yeah, it's absolutely true. Well, David, we've already talked about where you can be seen, but where is where is just one place I can point people on the web to just know everything that you're up to? Where where do you want to drive people? DavidPogue.com is my website, and and there is at the top a way to enter your email address, and then whenever I do a story or an episode or a book, you'll get an email notification and a link to it. So, uh, so DavidPogue.com is probably the central place. How did I do today? Did I do okay? You did very well. I, I think your best move was jettisoning the list of questions. I, I can I tell, tell you, when I watch TV and I see the reporter clutching a piece of paper, I'm like, oh, God, come on. You don't need to clutch a piece of paper for a half-hour conversation with somebody who is inherently interesting. <laughs> like, put the paper down, start the conversation going, and then just talk. I, I could go on. I literally have to go. I have a client who's in the waiting room on Zoom right now. It makes me mad that I have to go. But David, man, this has been awesome. This was a dream to interview uh, you and, and have you on my little channel. Thank you so much for making the time for me today. Super fun, man. And thanks for fixing my studio. My pleasure. It's what we do. <laughs> take care, man. Thank All you. All right. Take care. Bye.